with the setting sun it's a little might be a little difficult to see the water tower in Rouse's Point. We're on the other side of the lake at Windmill Point in Alberg. And we're at the lighthouse owned by the Clark family. If we look across at Rouse's Point, try not to zoom in too fast here. And uh, you might uh, hear a little bit of noise. We have a summer resident, a family that has moved in to the Windmill Point to Lighthouse area. That is an osprey nest way up there. And those aren't little pieces of uh, grass and such. Those are twigs and branches that help make up that nest. And every once in a while they kind of serenade us. I'm not sure if it's a friendly howdy or a, why don't you find some other place to gather type of chirping, but they're up there and uh, occasionally we can hear them in the background. We had hoped that our Recording would allow us to include a view of the lighthouse in the picture, but it appears like the proceedings will probably happen in the shade of the lighthouse right in this corner here. It's an annual meeting going on, and uh, they're having it here at the at the lighthouse. There we. A couple of speakers and I believe the first one we might hear will be Robbie Clark from Champlain whose family has owned this lighthouse for many many years now. Good evening everybody and welcome to the Windmill Point Lighthouse. I'm so glad that you're here with us this evening. My name is Christine Tepper. I am a co-president of the Albert Historical Society. And we are so glad that uh, Rob and Claire Clark have invited us here tonight to have our meeting. We did this about uh, nine years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I think, or nine years ago. 2003. 2003, so it's so good to be back here again. Uh, this happens to be the 15th anniversary of the Albert Historical Society. And it also happens to be the 10th anniversary of the relighting of the Windmill Point Lighthouse. So, very special occasion here. So, welcome. I'm glad that you're all here with us. The way this evening will go, we will have a very short business meeting as part of our annual meeting. And then we will have uh, our speakers. So, I hope you enjoy the evening. We have uh, light refreshments here. And I'm going to just ask you all to help, help yourselves as the, as the evening goes on. But there won't be a special time to go and eat. You just help yourself. So what I'd like to do is call the meeting to order officially. And we need to start by uh, reviewing the minutes from the business part. The meeting's over. We did it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have, uh, we have several speakers this evening. Um, I'd like to start and begin by introducing Rob Clark. Rob and his mother own this lighthouse. They've maintained it all these years. They own another lighthouse, the other one on Isla Mott. And, um, and this, is, this is a treat for us to get out here to see it and be here. So um, I'd like Rob to speak a little bit. He has some information he'd like to share and show us. Rob, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Windmill Point Playhouse. We certainly have a beautiful evening here tonight. Uh, there's a lot of history out here. Uh, most of you know that it came down an old dirt road, and uh, that was what it was known as a corduroy road. Back in the old days, what they would do is they would drop a bunch of logs down, and then silt the dirt would come in between and bring the fill in. And believe me, when we bought this place in 1963, it really looked like it had just been put down. It's 
So anyway, it's a super highway now. So we've all we've all been up on the, on, the, on that road today. And on your way out, you passed a lot of different other historical things you probably didn't even notice because they're all remnants of, of the past ones again. And that is the railroad. The railroads all came into being about 1850. And we went over three different places where they were, like I say, unbeknownst to you. And the ferry also was here, and it came down and it landed down at the end of this road down here behind us. This whole length of the peninsula was actually part of the ferry landing because it was a sail ferry at the time. And so when it became a power ferry, it then terminated at the end of this uh, corner down here below. Uh, anyway, uh, like I say, there's an awful lot of history out here. I've actually put together a few fact sheets, and I'd be glad to, to give them to you, whatever you'd like to look at them. I've got some of them posted over here in the corner. When we get done, if you'd like to look at some of it. Uh, like I say, there's a lot of a lot of history out here. It goes back a long time, long before the lighthouse, actually. The recorded history, anyway. Obviously, it goes back even, probably even further. But essentially, we're talking about 1740 is when the recorded history part of it started. And in that year is when a man by the name of Sir Francis Foucault had the rights from France to come down here and to settle this area. This was all wilderness. There was absolutely no homes, no nothing as you can imagine back then. And the first thing he did was to build a windmill right over where that tower now sits. And that's the site of that original windmill, that mounded up area over there. And that, uh, that windmill was very important because that was where all the farmers would come to grind the grain over the years. And as mankind became into what we know today, they started refining their flour and so forth, and doing their all the different grinding of the grains and whatever had to be done. And uh, that windmill served for approximately a hundred some years. And then about 18, in the 1830s, uh, the traffic on the lake was starting to really pick up. And during that, during that time, there was a uh, Navy Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Flat, that came out and he did a survey in the, of the lake. And he determined that there definitely needed to be a light right here at Woodmill Point. And he also filed the report to state that there was needed one on the southern end of the lake down at Crown Point. Because about eight years prior, which would be approximately 1830, what happened was is that they had a lot of the private shipping companies would actually put a, a lantern or a post light out and they would put that out there and they would use that to guide the ships. But a lot of times it proved inadequate because the light was either too small or was not intense enough. And so that's when the government got started to get involved. So finally it took, it took another actually 20 years as the government was slow back then too. But by 1857, May of May 20th, 1857, the United States government purchased this property that we are on right here for the purpose of building that lighthouse. And in 1858, it was completed. Now, I don't know the exact day, the exact month. And anyway, when the light was completed, they needed a keeper for it. And the keeper turned out to be a lady. Her name was Clarinda Mott. And she has the distinction of being the only Vermont woman lighthouse keeper known to exist in any of these lighthouses. And during that time, um, she served till right around the Civil War, so 1960 or so thereabouts. And what, what happened was, we're not sure, there again, a lot of these, these records are, some of it's hearsay, some of it has been turned down as all history has, and some of it's kind of uh, nebulous, vague. But we believe that uh, a man keeper came in, possibly because during the Civil War they wanted to reward some of the fellows that had served in the Civil War. And so anyway, the next keeper came in and took over. And anyway, uh, the, this lighthouse was manned until 1931. And ironically, the keeper, the last keeper to serve here, Edward Hill, was born at our other lighthouse at Isle of Mont. 
back in uh, 1881, I believe. So uh, anyway, he ended up keep coming over here, and of course we ended up buying the two lighthouses, so it's a connected sort of thing, if you will. Uh, anyway, uh, when, did, when the lighthouse keep here, uh, the last keeper was here in 1931, they needed to automate the, the lighthouse. They wanted to do away with the keeper. And that is when the Coast Guard, actually it was not the Coast Guard, that was built by the United States Lighthouse Service. There was two organizations under the Lighthouse Board entity, and that was the United States Lighthouse Service and the United States Lighthouse Establishment. They were both equal entities. Anyway, they're the ones that actually built that tower. And when the tower was built, uh, there was no longer a need for a keeper here. And anyway, uh, that, that went on, and uh, as you know, in 2002, 10 years ago, the light, as a matter of fact, the light that used to sit on that tower is right over in this corner. And when we get done here, feel free to go over and examine it. That was the last light to serve. As a matter of fact, this time, 10 years ago, it was still up there flashing because the actual date of the relighting was August 7th, but roughly 10 years ago. So anyway, um, trying to think here what else I could tell you about it. Um, but what happened was is that during this, this transition period, 1939 is when the United States Coast Guard got involved. So enough of the lighthouses had been automated at this point. And when they had, they decided they would merge what was left of the lighthouse service into the United States Coast Guard. And so in that time is when the Coast Guard came into being and in the lighthouse service. They actually existed obviously before that. Does anybody have questions about any of this? How long have you owned this? My mom and dad bought this in 1963. One of the things Rob mentioned is the historic, the historic elements, so the, the historic sites all along this this uh, stretch of land. And uh, one of the things Rob has mentioned to me a number of times is, wouldn't it be nice? if we had a, a type of historic marker here in Albert to show the other side of the ferry that used to come across from Rouse's Point to, to, to here, to the Windmill Point. And because um, they, ha they have a nice marker over in Rouse's Point of that. Wouldn't it be nice to have the other end of that noted here? And, um, and I think it would be nice to have that. We recently, our town recently went through um, a big study of research. Uh, the, it's called the Ancient Road, and Cheryl Dunn uh, headed that up. And Cheryl, we, you and I talked a number of times. We did. We never really came across this. In well, this this ferry landing belongs to the town. The town never relinquished the ferry landing, so it is town owned. The only thing is, is that the property across the street owns the land that goes to low water mark, but the town, but the town still owns that ferry landing. So there's there's gotta be a piece of property there that this, this marker could go on. So it could but our, it could still happen. It's not a it's not a dead right. issue. But we would like we would like some some Well it would be nice. I mean they did a they did a ceremony. Yes, they did a nice one across the way it'd be nice if we could have something here yeah. to to show both ends of that ferry landing from way back when. So we need to uh, we need to try to keep that going and, and I don't know where we go with that. Is that something we then bring forth to the select board show? Right, because all it's all been documented. It's all documented on paper. So it is. You've, you've got that. So right. so you can we can look to that right. piece of property and say the town does still own that and right. it's still in public hands. Right. Okay. Thank you. So that's what we do next. Right. Okay. Uh, I might add John Dunville who works at the historic markers actually came up here uh, in 2009 and hosted an event at the other lighthouse in Isla Mont uh, to celebrate the quadricentennial, which is Sam with the Champlain coming down the lake 400 years ago. And he had mentioned at the time he expressed interest in doing something of this nature. However, as you know, we've had a lot of different conditions of flooding in the last year, a lot of setbacks. I have tried to contact him, uh, and I, I believe that when time allows and the budget allows him to be back up here to investigate that issue, so, so uh, that'd be something to look forward to, because as Chris stated, and I'm 
Mont, we hit the marker over there for Shasey Landing and on Island Mont where it landed. So it would be nice to have another marker here to match the one in Ross's Point, in Ross's Point that's already been listed. So, that's on the to-do list. Yeah, that's on the to-do list. Like I said, folks, there's, there's, there is a lot of history, as you can see out here, and uh, like I said, I do have a few different handouts and stuff that you can look at. Uh, I posted a number of things over on the window. Uh, I have a few copies of the e lighting program from 10 years ago that I made some copies of. There's also a schematic that tells you a little bit about that lantern. Uh, I have a few of those. I also, uh, I also have a basic faction to a timeline, more or less, uh, for, for the lighthouse here at Windmill Point. Uh, I know that we have to kind of keep in our schedule here, but I want to tell you folks, um, uh, we, we have the senior chief here from Station Burlington. We're very fortunate to have him come over. It's a very busy schedule, and uh, it's really nice of him to take the time to come over here and be part of this with us. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Society and distinguished guests, thank you for the invitation tonight. My name is Dan Murray, and I'm the new senior chief in charge of Coast Guard Station Burlington. I've been blessed with a great career, and the Coast Guard's been really good to me. The Coast Guard's taken me to places like Charleston, South Carolina, where I worked on a 378-foot cutter that patrolled the Caribbean Sea to deter the flow of illegal drugs into our country. After that, I spent four years in San Francisco, operating 47-foot motor lifeboats in heavy weather and surf. I was in San Francisco on September 11th and helped secure the port in response to the terror attacks in New York City. I left the West Coast and was second in command of an 87-foot patrol boat we used to escort Navy ships into and out of the port of Norfolk and also to enforce fisheries laws on commercial vessels operating in the Middle Atlantic region. I left Virginia and went to Wilmington, North Carolina, where I worked on a 210-foot cutter that took me back to the Caribbean to stem the flow of illegal drugs and migrants into our country. Then I reported to my last job as second in command of Station Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, where I sent multiple crew members to the Gulf region in response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill off New Orleans, and I was certified for command. I reported to Station Burlington and relieved command in June. For those of you that don't know, Station Burlington is a very unique unit. Most Coast Guard stations have one or two primary missions and shared jurisdiction with neighboring units that are approximately 60 miles away. Station Burlington has several missions that we are required to balance, and we are the only representatives of the Coast Guard on the lake. This time of year, we're busy with search and rescue cases, law enforcement boardings, and marine events like the Independence Day fireworks show. In the fall, we will pull our seasonal buoys off the lake to prepare for winter. When the lake freezes, we switch roles toward our ice rescue mission. Then in the spring, we'll reset all our seasonal buoys and get ready for summer all over again. It's quite a bit of work for a crew of 25 people that range in age from 18 to 30 something. I could not be any more proud of the work that they do down there. Station Burlington's diverse set of missions are highly representative of the multi-mission nature of the entire Coast Guard. As an organization, we are created from several different agencies and we have transformed ourselves over the years as needed to best serve the American public. The modern Coast Guard was created in 1915 by joining the U.S. Revenue Cutter Service and the U.S. Life Saving Service, but our roots go back even further than that. We, collecti we collectively recognize the Coast Guard's birthday as August 4th, 1790. This is when Congress approved Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton's request to build 10 boats to protect and ensure revenue collection. 
This resulted in the creation of the Revenue Cutter Service, which was one of our young nation's first sources of federal revenue. At the time, the Continental Navy had been disestablished and would not be reestablished until 1799. Because we had no Navy, the role of the Revenue Cutter Service expanded in 1797 to defend the seacoast and repel any hostility. The Lighthouse Service, as Rob mentioned, was initially run by individual states as early as 1716 and joined the U.S. Treasury Department in 1789. It merged with the Steamboat Inspection Service and became part of the Department of Commerce in 1903. The U.S. Lighthouse Service eventually became part of the Coast Guard in 1939. Many of the lighthouse keepers are among our greatest rescuers as they rode out to rescue shipwreck victims in addition to all the other tasks required to keep their lights burning. In 1848, Congress approved a request to provide surf boats, rockets, and other apparatus necessary to protect life and property from shipwreck on the coast of New Jersey. This appropriation would eventually provide a chain of volunteer-operated rescue stations along the coasts of New Jersey and Long Island. Members of the U.S. Life Saving Service remained, volunteers, remained volunteers and were not paid for their work until 1871, 23 years later. The Steamboat Inspection Service was created in 1838 under the Justice Department, and in 1852 it became part of the Treasury Department. The Bureau of Navigation was formed in 1848 under the Treasury Department. The Steamboat Inspection Service and the Bureau of Navigation joined together in 1932 under the Commerce Department, and the combined agency became part of the Coast Guard in 1942. So as you can see, we're pulling from a lot of different places. The term Coast Guard was first used in 1915 to name the new agency made up from these various parts. The Coast Guard remained in the Treasury Department until 1967, when it was transferred in its entirety to the Department of Transportation. In response to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, the Coast Guard once again switched departments when the government created one organization consisting of all federal agencies that share an interest in protecting the homeland. On March 1, 2003, the Department of Homeland Security was created and the Coast Guard became the largest agency within DHS. Keeping up with all that information can be quite a challenge, so I appreciate opportunities like this to get out of the office. <laughs> These events help me learn more about the area and meet members of the various communities that make up the Lake Champlain Valley. <coughs> Earlier today, I was in a small Cessna airplane flown by one of our Coast Guard Auxiliary pilots. I had a chance to see the lake and this lighthouse from the air. In the short time that I've been in Vermont, I've met several people that are proud to be part of this area and are committed to sharing it with current and future generations. People like Arthur Cohn of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum who has dedicated himself to preserving and sharing the history of Lake Champlain. People who are members of organizations like the Alberg Historical Society that seek to preserve Alberg's past and promote an appreciation from Alberg's rich and colorful history. Got that right off the website. Um, for people like Rob Clark, whose grandfather purchased the Isla Mott Lighthouse in 1949 and whose father purchased this property in 1963, his family is dedicated to safeguarding these local treasures and preserving them for future generations to enjoy. With the help of a wise Coast Guard Admiral, Mr. Clark's family was able to relight this lighthouse 10 years ago. Today we commemorate the anniversary of that day as well as the 15-year anniversary of the Albert Historical Society. That Coast Guard Admiral realized that the lake and the people on it would be better off if this light were operating. The Admiral realized that the Coast Guard does not have unlimited funding to do all of the things that we would like to do. We need to make leadership decisions and trade-offs to ensure that we are being good stewards of the public trust and of our limited resources. That Admiral formed an alliance with Mr. Clark's family to relight the Windmill Point Lighthouse. That alliance ensured that the light would operate and provide a reduction in operating costs to the Coast Guard. 
The light that shines from this tower increases the safety of all those who operate on the lake and increases the beauty of the area to all who see it, whether from land or water. I find it very rewarding to work in an area where people are willing to do what they can to help others. In the Coast Guard, sometimes we refer to these partnerships as force multipliers. For example, Station Burlington has four boats and 25 people. One of those boats is an ice rescue airboat that we usually only use in the winter. So that leaves us three boats on a typical summer day. With the help of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, Vermont State Police, Fish and Wildlife Service, Burlington Police and Fire Departments, Colchester Police, and multiple Sheriff's Offices, we were able to put 14 boats and crews on the water to shut down the harbor for the recent <coughs> Independence Day fireworks show in Burlington. We also operated two radio communication centers and fed over 75 people that day. This is just one example of how people can help each other produce great things with limited resources. Thank you all for the things that each of you do to benefit our community, and thank you for coming here tonight. I look forward to building these relationships and enhancing these partnerships over the course of my time here. Have a great evening. There's a lake that's located entirely within a state, that's a state waterway. You won't see a Coast Guard station there. But um, on lakes that are bordered between two states, like Lake Champlain, Lake Tahoe, um, because it's a border between two states, it's a federal waterway. So that's why there's the federal presence of the Coast Guard here. And especially when you add in the international border at the north end of the lake, um, there's definitely a reason for a federal presence of the U.S. Coast Guard here. Um, but we are the only unit on the lake, and um, I talked with Mr. Clark about partnerships, and, and I couldn't do my job without them. Um, you know, if we get some a rescue case up here at the north end or a rescue case down at the south end, we're going to go for it, but it's not likely we're going to be the first one there. Um, lots of the fire departments, sheriff's departments, police departments have boats and rescue apparatus, and if there's a, a rescue case at either extremity of the lake, eight times out of ten, they're going to get there before we will. We're still going to go. We're still going to make the effort. If something doesn't work out with that first response, we'll be there. But um, but it's a, it's a good sized body of water to, to cover, and, and we're proud to do it. Thank you for the good work. Yes, sir. Thank you, for you mentioned the, the generous support you've received from the other agencies. I was surprised you didn't mention the U.S. Border Patrol because I believe they have two boats at least. I see two Border Patrol boats parked over here in Mississippi Bay. I don't know if they have any parked on the lake. And, and I apologize, sir. I've only been in this job about a month, so I haven't I haven't had a chance to open up that partnership with uh, Customs and Border Patrol up here. I know that they do a great job on the northern border of the lake. Um, I just haven't had an opportunity to work with them yet. And uh, specifically, uh, I, I was referencing the, the Burlington Fireworks show the other night. And, and although they do great things up here, they weren't there that night. So, I apologize for the confusion. I hope I can cover two resources for you. <laughs> yes, yes. And they, and they also seem to have a few helicopters, too. They do. And I've been told you they're great if, if we, uh, we need a helicopter to help us search. Our helicopter is actually down in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, so um, it might take a while to get a Coast Guard helicopter up here. But um, but I've been told that Customs and Border Patrol is a great asset for uh, for searching for lost boaters, searching for people on the ice, and um, I will open up that connection and that relationship soon. Thanks for keeping me on task, sir. <laughs> Any other questions?
also lives down in that lovely neighborhood, Kirkenfit, and uh, played a role in helping uh, Mr. Lalonde put together the booklet he did about the, uh, the history of the ownership of the property there. Susan um, uh, very graciously offered to speak tonight about connections she has to lighthouses and lighthouse keepers. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Susan and welcome. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, did I steal your no, thunder? No, actually that's good, because that kind of sets the stage for the background, and I don't have to really talk about those sorts of things. Um, my connection, I have a couple of connections to the, the history of Lake Champlain. First of all, I'm an American historian, and I am in particularly interested in the Northeast, and as the, the west coast of New England, so to speak, Lake Champlain is a really important body of water throughout the whole period that I studied, starting with uh, the, the um, European exploration of, of this region and I'm um, coming all the way up. Well, after 1815, I kind of think of other things being kind of spent, but in this case, I'm going to make an exception. Um, the other connection that I have is that my grandmother grew up in a lighthouse keeper's cottage here on Lake Champlain. Um, her father was James Wakefield, who was the light, Wait, James Wakefield Jr., I should say, who was the lighthouse keeper at Split Rock uh, between 1890 and uh, 1920. He was not the last lighthouse keeper there. There was actually one more keeper before they closed the lighthouse, put up a derrick like this, and um, put an end to having a, a keeper living there. I was always fascinated by the fact that my grandmother grew up in a lighthouse. I thought that was the coolest thing. And one day I asked her, I was probably like eight or nine years old, I said, well, you know, what was it like growing up in a lighthouse? You know, I was having all of these sort of, um, you know, uh, kidnapped and, and all of these Robert Louis Stevenson ideas about what it might have been like to, to live there. And she said, well, I guess my most uh, my strongest memory is of wool, wet wool. And I thought, really? Wet wool? What, wh why would that be the case? Well, it made sense when she started to explain that her father's primary duty, aside from making sure that the light was active and working, was rescuing people. And so the Split, the Split Rock Lighthouse sits where the broad lake narrows down, and there's a, it's also the place where boats coming up from the Champlain Canal into the broad lake most often got into trouble. So for instance, the um, steam uh, uh, boat, the Champlain, ran aground right off uh, Split Rock Lighthouse. And a, a, a number of both small and large boats had trouble there. And so when it was a bad if it was a bad storm, if it was if it was a bad season or if there was a ship in trouble, it was his job to go out and pluck people off of those sailing vessels and bring them ashore. And in a storm of course everybody's getting wet and so what do you do when you get inside is you hang up all of these these woolen garments and what do you get? The smell of steamy wool. And so that's one of her strong, was one of her strong childhood memories. She never told me, and I don't know if she knew, that her, her grandfather, my great-grandfather, had actually been a lighthouse keeper in Burlington Bay. And so James Wakefield Sr. was the, the um, North Light Lighthouse in Burlington Bay that was out on the breakwater, but he never lived in a keeper's cottage like this. The North Light, even though there was an intention to have people live there, 
it was inconvenient and in storm was downright uncomfortable. And so they, they live actually on the shore. And if you've ever been to the restaurant Shandy on the Shore, that was his, chan his ship Chandler's business. And it was his job, and, when the, and, and whenever there were troubles in Burlington Bay, it was his job to get out the rescue boat and go take people off. And so when the General Butler went down in Burlington Bay in a very stormy November, uh, one stormy November, I should say, and the crew ended up on the breakwater, it was James Sr. and his son, James Jr., who took the rescue boat, risked their lives, and went out to get the crew from the General Butler off of the breakwater and bring them into shore. So it's interesting. I don't think that the, um, the men of my grandmother's family were, were very um, boastful about their accomplishments. Because since I didn't hear this from her, I had the really amazing experience of going to the Shannon on the shore, having dinner, picking up the menu, and reading about my great grandfather. And <laughs> so that was an interesting experience. Since then, I've done a lot more research, and I know a bit about you know their life there and so on. So, um, so that's been uh, really kind of eye-opening um, for me. Um, one of the first, actually, the first lighthouse officially built lighthouse on Lake Champlain was actually the Juniper Island light. It makes sense about where that would have been because of the, the broadness of the lake there and, and the amount of lake traffic. And it was actually in response to two things. One was the lumber uh, traffic that was coming south from Canada. There was an enormous amount of lumber coming south from Canada. And the other was the knowledge that the Champlain Canal was going to increase traffic out. And so there was this um, sort of intent to begin to um, see this waterway as being incredibly important. And of course, over three major wars, it was a theater of war. First, it was uh, the French and Indian War, then the American Revolution, and then the War of 1812. So no, there's, there's absolutely no question that this was seen as a strategic waterway. So it doesn't make, it doesn't really surprise me that by the mid-19th century there were 12 operating lighthouses on the way, six on the New York side, six on the Vermont side, that I've been able to find. There might have been more. There were also unofficial lighthouses, which um, were there because of necessity. So for instance, you can't see the house from the water now, but if you're driving to the shrine on Isle of Lot, and you get to the top of the hill before you go down the hill and around the corner to go to the shrine. There's a big stone house that sits on the top of that hill. The north windows of that house were actually the lighthouse before the Isle of Mont lighthouse was built. So there's all sorts of like uh, unofficial and, um, and as Dan pointed out, people who were doing their bit to try and make the lake traffic very safe and, and providing light was one of the ways in which they would do that. Um, I don't want to talk too long about this. I, I'd rather, you know, you enjoy your, your uh, goodies and, and maybe give you the chance to ask questions. Um, what I would finish up by saying is that um, the tradition of being lighthouse keepers in my family was something that I didn't know a lot about until I started doing this research, but it's, I'm very proud of it because I think that it's part of a long history of the way in which people learn how to live in their environment and make it safe and make it work for them. So being a lighthouse keeper was part of that um, process. And James Wakefield Sr. was also a person who was very important to the shipping that went on on the lake. As a chandler, he provided sales. He outfitted ships and so on that came into Burlington Harbor. So his work was directly related to the traffic that went on the way. And the, the traffic itself is really interesting. You can see all sorts of, of um, 19th century editions of it. Um, if you look at the Burlington Free Press, the Burlington, it actually isn't called the Burlington Free Press, I think it's called the Burlington Daily Press, but it's the progenitor of the Burlington, Burlington Free Press. You can see articles about the lake, about people, 
uh, um, who were both sailing it and working on it, as well as rescuing people on it. So it, that's a fascinating resource. Um, another really interesting resource for uh, information about stuff that went on in the lake is a whole series of um, different um, diaries and log books and so on that were kept by the lighthouse keepers themselves. That, unfortunately, is primarily kept in Washington, D.C. at the National Archives. But the last time I was in Washington, I had a chance to go and look at the log books that James Wakefield kept. And there's all sorts of information, like the people that he rescued, their names, the boats that he saw, and other sorts of things, like the first time an airplane flew over, you know, he rode in it, 1912, and things like that. So it's a, it, there's all sorts of really interesting um, elements about this that I think that could make for some wonderful stuff. And I did not know that there was a woman white house teacher here at this place. I'm going to know a lot more about that if I have a chance. So, um, anyone have any questions? Yeah. Do you have any idea how much a lighthouse keeper earned? I know exactly what they earned because I have the um, letters from the Department from, of the Treasury naming James Wakefield Sr. and James Wakefield Jr.'s um, yearly salary for a number of years. In 1890, for instance, James Wakefield Sr. got paid like uh, $175 for his year's wages, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in addition to that, he also got all of his meals were paid for and his housing was paid for. So it was actually a pretty respectable living for the time. Other questions? Fifteen, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so, and, uh, all of his, his videos, he allows people to view them. Uh, www.hometowncablenetwork.com And uh, like I say, he's always can always use it a few extra dollars. So, Calvin, thank you very much. Thank you, Calvin. You know, folks, uh, like I say, there's, there's a lot of feeling, there's a lot of emotions here. Uh, I'd like to could have just a moment of silence for a few of the people I mentioned here uh, that are no longer with us. My dad, of course, my aunt Erica, uh, the man whom we bought this lighthouse from, Mr. Emil Bear, our friend Admiral Richard A. Bowman, who was instrumental. I always give him credit for planting the seed that has come to fruition here. Uh, Mr. Merrick Carpenter, who was a, a famous captain on the lake, Frank Pax, who Calvin's interviewed before, and last but not least, Bell and Russ Singer, who did so much for Albert community. Can we have a moment of silence for those folks, please? Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else. 
Um, the only thing we have coming up is uh, Friday, July 27th begins the Festival of the Islands. That will be lots of different activities going on throughout the islands. A lot of places are open for business, nonprofits, whatever. We will have the Albert uh, Firehouse open on that Friday for those of you that would like to come and see the progress we're making inside. We'll also have uh, some of our books for sale that day too. If you'd like any, that would be wonderful. So, hope to see you then. Right. Rob, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And like I say, I have some different handouts and we can talk a little bit here before it gets dark. If anybody has any questions or whatever, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Uh, and like I say, uh, thanks to Susan for the wonderful talk you gave. The Senior Chief, and Chris and Howie, and thanks so much everybody. Thank you everyone for being here. We've advanced to the next day. It's Friday the 13th, and uh, we have come back to Champlain, and we're with Robbie Clark in his uh, workshop. So pay no attention if you see a, a greasy monkey wrench on the floor. This is <laughs> a place of work, but he's uh, put up a little display here. And first of all, the fellow who took this picture must have been kind of tall, Robbie. Yeah, tall fellow. Uh, this is actually taken by Roger Harwood's brother, Doug. A uh, little Cessna plane, I think, that he has. And uh, taken a few years ago. Uh, this gives you an overview of what the uh, lighthouse looks like from the air. This is uh, a picture taking, uh, taken from the south, looking north towards Fort Montgomery and the uh, Rosses Point Korean Veterans Bridge and uh, the old railroad trestle. Okay, and of course, uh, I know... Uh Doug Harwood took a lot of shots for Jim Millard of the uh, of Fort Montgomery. Uh, Jim Millard has a great uh, website. It uh, includes a lot of information on uh, on Fort Montgomery. What else you got in that book, Rob? Okay, Calvin, we got uh, this is pictures taken uh, ten years ago. Uh, this is out in the in the shop here, right where we're, actually right where we're standing now. All right, and that old fella, that's your father, yeah, Lockwood. Yeah. Lucky Clark with his uh, Sunday best, as they say. <laughs> uh, that's uh, what, what, what we did here. That's a picture of the uh, top portion of the pedestal. The pedestal is the apparatus that holds the, the modern optic, the, the Fresnel lens, the light, mm -hmm. 300 millimeter light. Uh, there's an example of it here. <clears throat> this is a red, a red light, and the reason why it's red is because at the time, uh, we were trying to get the bolt pattern, and the Coast Guard hadn't determined whether they were going to swap the old 250 millimeter lights, which is the one you can, it's hard to see because of the, it's in the, the reflection from the, the, the light coming in the window, but it's sta standing up on this other right. temporary setup that we had. And uh, what, we, what we were doing, like I said, is we were, we were trying to determine what, what, which ones they were going to use, so we had to have, drill it both ways so that if they decided to go with one light, we would use one set of bolt patterns, and if they use the other, we'd use the other set, and so forth. Okay. Uh, then down down below is is the framework uh, for the solar panel before it was painted. Uh, there's another picture uh, a couple pages on here uh, showing it with the solar panel in place. Uh, the bottom picture is all the sections that we had to put together. Now the original pedestal was left fortunately over to windmill point and it was all made of cast iron so it's all one piece the fact that we don't have access to a foundry anymore up here in champlain we actually fabbed the thing so we did it all piecemeal so all those pancake pieces that you see there are all stacked together and consequently make what's what you what you're seeing right here all when it's all assembled okay all right Well, this book was the book that they referred to that was available last night at right. the at right. the site. Uh, uh, yeah. Our uh, president, Chris Tepper, uh, graciously put this together for me. I uh, had the stuff all just laying around in envelopes, and she said, "Well, I said you you do take pi the pictures that you think are the most appropriate. I'll let you make the selection." And this is what she came up with. So okay, there you are with the with a lamp. Right. That is called a lamp. 
Yeah, it's it's yeah, a marine lantern is what it's really called. Okay. Uh, originally, it was the, the Fresnel or the Fresnel, depending on how how you wish to pronounce it. We always, when you're at our lighthouse, we always say Fresnel. We always thought it had a better ring than Fresnel, but it's pronounced either way, uh, and it's based on uh, Augustin Fresnel's work from uh, back in the 18, I think it was around 1830 thereabouts. He developed the uh, the Fresnel lens, and that was really a, a really a major uh, milestone because before that lighthouses relied on reflectors and candles and, and, and the like and the light only showed maybe a half mile a mile it just didn't show far enough so they still were having shipwrecks but when he developed this technology they were able to increase the 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 flame or the which came from the kerosene lamp they were able to increase that light and amplify it magnify it thousands of times and get it to to show where it really needed to do some good, and that was that was the beginning of of uh, modern navigation, where they didn't keep having shipwrecks. Okay. And so what they did is this is all plastic. The original the original lens was all handcrafted in France. It was all held in a brass framework with individual uh, prisms. And so, like I say, over the years they've they've found ways to cast it into plastic so basically it's the same principle only with the with the modern way of 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 making the lens okay the bottom picture is kevin Irwin. uh some of you may remember seeing him in calvin's videos that he did uh he was interviewed by gordy at windmill point and he also spoke at the isla mont lighthouse and he also was the one that presented dad and i with the lighthouse caps as you may recall okay uh the, the mechanism here is called the lamp changer. That's what's underneath this lens cover here. And what, what he's doing here is installing it. My dad and I put everything in. We put the light in. We put all the, all the conduit work, the electrical. We put in the solar panel. The battery was brought by the Coast Guard. And this mechanism was put in by them. It also needs to be aimed because there's a channel that is out there between Windmill Point and Isla Mott and it has to be set up properly so that that it shows brightest in that channel and like i say we're in the process right now of installing that in this particular picture okay <clears throat> now this picture was taken by john carey and you can see the date there i think calvin can make can make it out it's taken in june of 2002 and this shows the, the final assembly for the uh, <clears throat> solar collectors. And uh, if you look closely, you'll notice there's a difference between the two. And the reason being is because the railings are different in each lighthouse. So in order for it to bolt in, it had to be custom made for each lighthouse. Also, it has to extend out beyond the railing because they did not want any shadowing on the on the solar panel they wanted to make, make sure that it got optimum charging ability so it sticks out beyond so that it was quite a lot of engineering that went into doing that uh, it's a 20 watt panel it's uh, adequate for for running that light uh, which is kind of hard to believe but it, it does work quite well um, this is the the two lamps themselves that are sitting on the floor like I say we hadn't yet brought them over to the lighthouses and uh, Anyway, uh, and then there's the test stand that we were using for the other light behind me on my right in the picture. Okay, and again, there are two there because you're also talking about Isla Mott, not just the, the one in Alberg at Windmill Point. Now, those there are stationary. You don't need to move them according to the... Right, they both face, they both face the south, and they're set. I'm trying to remember the... I think it was... trying to remember the degrees. Was it like 37 and a half degrees, something like that? It's all... We got the dimensions uh, from the people who make the panel. We, got, we contacted them and they, depending upon your latitude and longitude, there's, there's an optimum angle that they're set at. And these are set at that base for where, where we live here. Okay. Uh, next group of just some uh, really nice looking shots basically right right for the most part actually i'd like to point out too uh at the time uh, there was a coast guard photographer that was sent up from public relations in new york city 
and these are actual Coast Guard, official Coast Guard photograph, uh, photographs. And uh, unfortunately, they were going to do a story, but it never got, never got done. But at least I did get the pictures out of it. So. <laughs> Big help. That's right. It helps. That's, that's good. All right. You can see the solar panel there. Go ahead. Yeah. There is another angle, another shot. Uh, if you look, you can see the skeleton tower here in the back. And it still has, these are what they call the day boards. This up here at the top, this has a W on it. So when, 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 the, when the Coast Guard was still using this tower, this would, this would identify the lighthouse as Windmill Point. Okay. Um, the one at Isle of Mont had an M on it, of course, for, for Mont, for Isle of Mont. Right, well, naturally, yes. Right. And these were, these were done with reflective tape, and they had like a black and white pattern on them. And, of course, now that this tower is not being used, they've been taken down. And, of course, it, you could obviously tell the day mark. You can tell by looking at the lighthouse. You don't need to, to have an actual letter on it. And the tower is being used. Right. The tower is currently the, the, the aid to navigation as it was from 18, approximately 1858 till 1931. Well, it's the lighthouse, but I'm talking about the tower, the old tower that was just taken out of commission is now being used by the birds. Right. The, the osprey nest is in there, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. They, they're the new tenants, but they don't pay anything. <laughs> they pay you in poop. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right, and move. do they ever. <laughs> Moving right along. Now this this picture here, uh, this is different. Different websites have this particular picture right here. Uh, this is Senior Chief Jim Stoidel. He has the same capacity as the man we met last night, uh, Dan Murray. Uh, every four years they have what they call a change of command, and they get a whole new batch of people that come in to work at Station Burlington. Uh, He's presenting a plaque to my dad right here uh, in the picture. And also the old light from the skeleton tower is being presented to me. Uh, you can see Mr. Art Cohen off to the side with my dad. Mm -hmm. And of course, a picture of my mom and dad the night of the, the relighting ceremony on August 7th, 2002. Alrighty. And there's another shot. Uh, it's my friend Randy Poisson down there uh, holding my old camcorder. Uh, and there's a picture which is very appropriate. is the uh, flag that was draped over uh, one of his son's uh, caskets. Uh, he lost two of his sons in a tragic uh, accident back uh, in 97, I believe it was. Okay. Important picture for him and his family, I'm yes. sure. Yes. And it was nice, I was telling the chief, uh, I know when I was at Station Burlington down in the lobby, they had that particular uh, photo on display down there. So I don't know if it's still there currently or not, but uh, at any rate, it was there a short time ago. A couple of landlubbers. Yeah, landlubbers, yes. And uh, that's my dad and I. Uh, this was taken by Rob Swanson. He's a photographer for the, for the Rutland Herald newspaper. And uh, he graciously gave me some copies of what he took that particular evening. Yeah, photos like this with somebody who has a photographer's eye are always great. And I think you've got some more coming right up here. I think I do, yes. It was a beautiful evening, very much like it was last night. These pictures were taken in 03, uh, shortly about it, roughly a year after the actual event. Yeah, very nice. You and your dad? Yes. And and your dad with the yeah. with the lighthouse. And the official Coast Guard <laughs> lighthouse keeper's hat. <laughs> that he wore proudly. Yes, he most certainly did. All right. <clears throat> Another shot taken from the landing room. The sun low in the sky, or yes. I assume it's low, not early morning. It's yeah, it, it, correct. It's it's the setting sun in the west. Yeah. Okay. And this particular picture right here, uh, 
was the picture that they chose for the for the story that the Rutland Herald did uh, yeah. in that particular publication. Move the top up a little bit. I think we can get some glare. There we go. That, that's just, just a great silhouette shot. It's amazing. I can't, like I said, with somebody who has an eye for photography. Right. You know, a lot of people can take pictures, but right, <laughs> there exactly. are people that, that can do this right. also. Exactly, yes. That's, that's, that's what they hire, hire them for, as they say. Yep. So is that the end of the book? Uh, yeah. Uh, we can see if there's a couple other things we might want to look at. All right. Okay, here's a picture that shows the... Uh, the way you guys used to come in before you had neighbors, and that right away is still there, but uh, not to cause uh, problems with your neighbors, you kind of avoid that that right. right in by the lake. Right. You can see the gate there, you can see the path uh, that would run in front of all those new houses that are built there now that's north of the uh, lighthouse. Correct. Okay, and you have one more picture you wanted to show us of the, the Admiral? Right, okay, yes, yes. The uh, and this is the man that we always, uh, I've talked about many different times uh, at the lighthouse. This is Admiral Richard A. Bowman, and he's the fellow that finally uh, acted on all the letters that my dad had sent over the years asking and inquiring as to what happened to the original equipment, the original lens, and the pedestal that was missing over at Isla Mont and the descriptions of the property. Uh, the Admiral, uh, like I say, was a great lover of lighthouses, and uh, he's the one that came up here with his uh, wife, Dottie, and they, uh, you know, took a look at the lighthouses, and he's the one that also said, what do you guys think about putting those lights back in the tower? And we said, sure, Admiral, we've thought about it many times, but that's about as far as we ever got. So I can say I've always credited him for, uh, you know, letting the Coast Guard realize uh, about Lake Champlain and about the, the great lighthouses that are, uh, that are up here. Uh, I'm sure they knew about them, but they just kind of, uh, kind of were putting the back, back, on the back, back, far burner, as they say. Right. And uh, he, I could say, is uh, at least was in a position to bring light on the subject, so to speak. Okay. All right. So this is his memorial service, uh, 2005. Yes. And you lost your father what year? In 2009, February 5th, 2009. And the Admiral passed away on February 15th. And uh, I lost my grandfather, Robert C., February 1st. So February is not a yeah. not a good year for, for us folks. So when you get to February, you get a little nervous? I sure do. <laughs> okay. All right, Rob, we appreciate uh, inviting us over there last night. And we appreciate the look at uh, some very, very nice photos and a little history of that uh, Windmill Point Lighthouse uh, in Albert, Vermont. Thank you, Calvin. Appreciate you coming. Owned by the Clark family, as is the Alamont Lighthouse.